Hi ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brooke Hanneman and I am here to introduce you to the theater portion of your Arts 51 course. I really wish that I was there with you in person because theater is a live in-person art, but just wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction before we get things kicked off. Now, the word theater comes from the word theatron and that's an ancient Greek term for seeing place. I was going to do a quiz, I bet I would put that on the quiz, hypothetically speaking. Um, but we know that theater has existed before written history. A lot of the information that we have about how theater got its start though, comes from Greek theater. So you're gonna get an overview of theater history embedded within this course, but Basically, one thing that you should know is that some of our first recorded plays come from Greek theater during the festival of Dionysus. Again, if I were going to write a quiz, I bet Dionysus would be on there. However, Dionysus is the god of the Greek god of wine, revelry, and fertility. And if you think back to ancient times, human survival was based around fertility, fertility of crops, fertility of animals, fertility of people. Um, and so the Greeks wanted to make the gods happy. So there was a festival for Dionysus to make him happy. And part of that festival became a competition of plays. It started out just as tragedy and then it moved into comedy. Again, you have a video that will tell you all about the genres and the history of theater, but just wanted to give you that kind of as a background. Now, what is theater and how is it different from some of the other performing arts um, or visual arts? One thing about theater is that it is live. It is in the moment happening right now and it requires two groups. It requires the audience. You are in Bulber Auditorium right now of McNeese State University. Welcome from the point of view of an actor. So this is what you would see. Um, so the two groups is the audience and the performer. They both have to be present in the moment in the same space. And that live quality of theater is one of the basic cores of theater. Another quality that's very strong within theater is that it is a collaborative art. It's not like uh, one performer goes off with an instrument, practices guitar or paints. Um, it, it requires lots of different people to come together to create the product that you see when you come into the audience and you come to see a production. Now, collaborative, we kind of think of that in two ways with theater. Number one, it hits every single genre. I'm a theater nerd, so one of the things that I love about theater is that it incorporates music, it incorporates dance, it incorporates visual arts, it incorporates uh, literature, it incorporates acting. Every type of art form that we have really can be seen on stage, but also collaborative means something else too. That refers to the fact that theater is uh, requires practitioners from all different angles to help feed into that one production. For instance, you will have actors, you will have a director, a stage manager to help manage the production once it's on its feet. You will have costume designers, set designers, prop designers, you can have fight choreographers. Um, it just goes on and on and on depending on what the production is. It is a very collaborative art. One of my favorite examples of the collaborative nature of theater uh, revolves around a production of The Tempest, uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest. And in that production, there's a character named Ariel. And Ariel is a sprite and uh, a, a fairy, a spirit kind of. And there is another character named Prospero and he's sort of a wizard. And he has uh, freed Ariel from a bad past life. And, uh, and so Ariel is kind of a servant to Prospero. And during the course of the play, Ariel does Prospero's bidding throughout the show. At the very end, Ariel pleads for freedom. And Prospero says, I, I will grant it to you if you do my bidding. So Ariel does the bidding. And at the very end of the play, he comes back to be freed. Now, here's what the power of theater can do. Uh, there's an outdoor production of The Tempest that was done by a Shakespeare company in the United States. And they were doing an outdoor production of The Tempest. The designers and the directors got together and they timed it so that towards act three, when Ariel is uh, being freed, 
was just about the time when twilight was starting. Um, so outdoor, the sun had gone down, the sky had gone purple. The theater itself was right at the edge of a lake and trees all around. So fireflies started coming out. You could start to see a sprinkling of stars up above. And where they were um, geographically, uh, the lake was, uh, was surrounded by mist um, when twilight would come. So within the production, Ariel goes to Prospero and asks, may I have my freedom? And Prospero grants the freedom. And the spirit who has been yearning for centuries to be free is released. And so the way that they did this within the theatrical production is imagining you're the audience and this is the lake and this is the playing space behind you. Ariel turned around towards the lake breathed in freedom and just started running straight to the water, just free for the first time, running, running, running. And the audience is watching it, knowing that when the actor who's portraying Ariel gets to the edge of the lake, then obviously the actor is going to have to veer and go around the lake. But the actor kept running and kept running and kept running and hit the water and kept running and ran over the water into the mist and disappeared. The scenic designer for this play had built just a few inches underneath the water, a ramp that went out into the lake far enough so that the actor could run and disappear running on water. That is an example of the magic of theater. Some people think uh, theater is not their cup of tea, but I promise you, if you feel that you probably have never seen excellent theater before, because that experience of being right there in the presence of these performances and this magical kind of energy can only happen in live situations. Now, theater also presents itself as fiction. So we all know when we walk into this theater that when we see the sunset on stage, it's really just a series of light cues. We know that the gun is shooting blanks. We know that the marriage ceremony that's happening on stage doesn't really stick. It doesn't count. Um, and we know that the whiskey bottle uh, is full of iced tea. And yet the audience enters into the space um, ideally with a willing suspension of disbelief. Now, what that means is it means you know that these things aren't real and yet you are allowing yourself to enter into the world of the art that is created around you so that you really experience it. And it really happens in good theater. Um, you'll cry real tears. Sometimes your, your pulse will quicken, uh, you'll laugh real laughter, all of these are biological reactions to something as though it were real, even though we all know that it's not. Now the actor also deals with that kind of unique fiction in the sense that the actor has to live truthfully in imaginary circumstances. A lot of people use that as a definition for acting, living truthfully in imaginary kind of situations. And also as an actor, when you're on stage, everything that's happening to your character you have to present it as though it's happening for the first time. If your character uh, walks in and finds his, her husband with a, another person, you have to experience that as though it was for the first time, even though you've probably done the play eight times that week for weeks on end, and it is not at all new to you. So as an actor, it's the actor's job to make it look like it's happening for the first time. Everything that is happening to them has never happened before. Um, so that's another one of, kind of the unique kinds of fictions. Um, and you know, audience, audience entering into the fiction with suspension of disbelief is not new to theater. You do it all the time. You do it when you watch television. You do it when you watch film. Uh, you do it when you watch wrestling. Um, you, uh, you do it when you read a book. Um, I would say you do it when you go to a hospital and you find out how much a Band-Aid supposedly costs in an emergency room. There, there are all kinds of ways that you actually interact with fiction in a way that you are willing to kind of go there. Um, so that's something that's that's not new to you. Now, theater in general, whether you think you're a theater or a person or not, it's all around you all the time. If you like the saints, go saints. Um, 
when you watch NFL football, that is entirely theatrical. You even have an intermission and like a show in between oftentimes for the Super Bowl, for instance. Um, you experience the theatrical around you in pageants, in Mardi Gras. Um, it's all around you all the time. And also, for those of you who think that you're not actors, when I uh, teach my acting courses, I always ask, how much acting experience do you have? Raise your hand if you've ever acted before. And some people don't raise their hand. That's a lie. Every human being acts every day because the actor tools are the voice, the mind, the body. You as an actor have an objective that you need to reach. There are obstacles that come in between you and you do things that you can work around those obstacles. It's everyday life for us. And I would bet that you probably, at least to some extent, act or talk or communicate differently with your favorite grandma or your two-year-old child or the officer who just pulled you over for her speeding ticket. You are yourself, but you are communicating in different ways depending on who it is that you're talking to. And I would also put out there that actor training can be very beneficial for children. It can be beneficial probably to whatever profession it is that you're pursuing here within the university. I know as an acting professor um, at a university that I taught at in Columbus, I had the chief of police from the university who would come and take my acting class. And even the exercises in relaxation or breath control, um, communication, all of those things, he, he would talk within the class a lot and saying that this is very valid. As an officer of the law, I have to walk into very heightened situations and I have to have a composure about me, whether or not what I'm looking at is horrific frightening. I have to be able to present myself as an authority figure who is in control of the situation and breathing correctly and supporting yourself moving into that is something that they use all the time. If you want to be a lawyer and, and you're going to be a trial lawyer, I don't know how many trial lawyers I've had in my acting classes. They train themselves often because they have to use the same tools that an actor uses on stage. And I would I would argue that we use these tools every day in our life, no matter whether our professions are like that or not. So we know that the theater is not real and yet we enter into it with a suspension of disbelief. And we actually feel things from it. You're gonna see a couple of videos. You're gonna see a production of August Wilson's Fences and two different actors are gonna play the lead role, Troy. James Earl Jones goes for the throat, jugular, drama, tragedy. And then you'll see Denzel Washington uses the same script, the same lines, the same play, and completely goes in an entirely different direction. It's funny, he uses comedy. And that's one of the magic things about theater is that every single time you enter into a production, the director, the actors, the designers, everyone is going to have a different take on it. And so it's going to create something that's absolutely brand new. So just to recap, theater, it's live, it's collaborative, it's, and it's also not just entertainment. It can be entertainment. Also throughout history, you can look at plays from hundreds of years ago and understand about how mankind thought by looking at the plays that were written and performed and how they were performed. So it's used as a preservation of history. It's used as education. It can be used in therapy. It's used oftentimes to fight for social justice. So all of these things are aspects of theater that I want you to know about. Uh, if you're watching this video, then obviously we're all post COVID at this point. I think there was a a kind of a, an idea that the arts can be viewed as frivolous or luxurious or um, non-essential. But after the isolation of COVID, I think what we saw globally is where did people go when they were isolated? They went to film, they went to television, they went to video games, which is created by artists. They went to music, they went to books. People sang to each other off of balconies in Italy, across 
the lawns because they couldn't touch each other physically. Theater is a way that we look at how it is to be human in the world, how to navigate the world, and how to tell our stories. And no matter what your background is, you have a story to tell. And theater is a great way that you can share that. So I hope you enjoy the course. I really hope that you come out and see some shows. All the shows that we put on with banners at McNeese State University are free for students. So come out and see some good stuff. And uh, I hope to see you in the lobby. Thank you.